You know, back when I was in the academy, we would follow every toast with a song. Books gone before a Star Trek Next Generation podcast hosted by myself, Jay Record, and my father, Jake Record, for the benefit of Jake's grandson and my son, Ben the Bear. Though we know there's so many fans out there of the Next Generation that we are putting all these shows for free out on YouTube. How are you doing tonight, Jake? I'm good, Jay. So, uh, tonight is a really fun episode. We're going to be looking at the big goodbye, which is Star Trek Season 1, Episode 12 which debuted on uh, January 11th, 1988. Uh, this is a gigantic holodeck episode. Really right. from the end. And there's uh, just a lot of fun to be had. And uh, unlike previous episodes, not as much seriousness. But, you know, maybe we'll discover something along the way. So sure. let's uh, kind of in- introduce everyone to what's going on in the show. So the crew of the Enterprise-D is en route to meeting with the Harado on a diplomatic mission. Captain Picard is having to uh, memorize and recite this complicated greeting in their native tongue without errors. Otherwise, this meeting will fail. Apparently, this um, race of aliens, which we never actually see on camera, though we hear their voices, uh, are very finicky about proper etiquette and if you fail to say this greeting correctly they will not speak to you and cut off diplomatic negotiations for decades and they're an an insectoid species that's right thank you the harada is an insectoid species right so um we find picard and counselor troy practicing Mm -hmm. this greeting which features a lot of clicks hisses and grunts and um he is obviously very tired so she suggests that he needs to take a break and he does so by going to the holodeck which he mentions has been recently upgraded to not only be a training tool but also um a place for the crew to have recreation this is a uh, where we kind of walk into uh Jean-Luc Picard's actual like love that we find outside of being a a starfleet captain he has a love for 1940s noir mysteries apparently Mm -hmm. um he gets into the in fiction universe um the dixon hill novels which apparently uh i was looking into it they are Dixon Hill is was in a magazine called um, Mystery Quarterly. I actually looked this up because they uh, they actually used a real they actually used a real pulp magazine from right our right. world. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Dixon Hill series of novels. Yeah. Yeah, Amazing Detective Stories. So Amazing Detective Stories in publishing has a, like a really long history of publishing some of the really, some of the best mystery and thriller authors out there. So, and they've been doing it since the 30s. So for them to harken back to this, um, I actually thought it was pretty cool. It means there is an appreciation of culture within Starfleet and within the Federation um, for Earth history on a very aesthetic level that's very much beyond... You know, I feel like a lot of our cultural history today is very much out of history books. We talk about World War II, we talk about sports and sports events, stuff like that, but um, 
it seems the culture of the Federation, or at least Picard, has a real value in terms of literature and historical literature. Um, I was just wondering what you thought about that. It's it's very well, interesting to see Picard have this interest. I, I I agree with you. I think it's just it's it's a a light episode. It's not. It, there's not a lot of heavy. Uh, at least on the surface, and I and digging down, I, I don't, I can't find a lot of, you know, heavy um, issues to discuss and so on. I think it interests, you know, it's interesting. It just, you know, we'd seen the holodeck like in um, the first episode in Far in Farport, and it was introduced there, and now it's we have a, a episode where it's pretty much dedicated to a, hol- a holodeck story. And I think that's good because it gives viewers and fans, um, you know, just educates them more what it's about and so forth and what it's capable of, particularly with where the story ends, where, you know, Mr. What's his name tries to leave and so forth. And, you know, and Picard knows, go ahead, dude, because you're going to disappear as soon as you walk out into the, right. pa- uh, the passageway. So it sets up, a further, arch. yeah, the arch. A further appreciate the, of the holodeck that plays a key role in in future episodes and in future seasons. As far as Picard goes, you know he, you know, comes across as a sophisticated uh, individual, an intellectual. As you said, he appreciates uh, literature because, you know, I don't, I can't remember how often we've seen him you know, reading a book in his cabin and so, so forth, so far. Um, and we, we and, and, and in future episodes, we'll learn that uh, Picard almost had a career as an, an exo archeologist. Mm-hmm. So he under, he appreciates, you know, very practical history in that, in that sense. So um yeah, it does. It does, um, you know, underline the importance of culture, and it's a, it's another point of discussion and theme that comes up in many episodes when they're visiting new worlds, that they have to appreciate, they have to understand, and 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 you know sometimes adapt to dealing with a culture when they're on a new world or on a world that they visited before, and they they go down and they know what the rules are there. It should also be noted that, like, Picard has been a fan of Dixon Hill apparently since he was a child. Like, he's been into these novels for a very, very long time. So I think it plays into what you just said about, you know, maybe there's a quality in the future of Starfleet where they look for Starfleet officers and captains who have an appreciation for maybe the things they come across from an actual anthropological perspective. Well, and, and that, that's a good point brings up because... Um, because do you think Archer... I, I wanted to ask you this because you just finished Enterprise not too long ago. Right. Archer's not very much of an anthropologist where it seems like Picard is. And I know that we compare Kirk and Picard a lot, but I think Archer's actually an interesting um, comparison here, a point of contrast here too. Uh, I don't recall that... You know, Archer was interested in, you know, history and so forth, but I don't remember much about an archaeological bent because this is when, you know, we were just, you know, going out on a Warp 5 ship, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, not... (laughs) It's more about relationships. Yeah, escaping from the tutelage of the or the control even of the Vulcans and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that you said, in, interesting, is that you wanted to have, you know, Starfleet officers to be well-rounded. There's something that happens at times where, you know, when I went to college at, at some point, I th- thought I wanted to go to medical school, was pre-med and so forth, ended up just with a, a biology degree. But I remember my first dorm counselor uh, in Virginia was a history major. Mm -hmm. And he took enough basic sciences that he, I'm sure, did well on the MCAT. 
and he was from Danville, Virginia, mm -hmm. right along the North Carolina border. And he, he applied to University of Virginia Medical School and was accepted. And I remember saying, you know, you're a history major. Why are you, you know, why are you going to medical school? He says, well, that's my interest. And medical schools want people. They don't want a bunch of science nerds. They want people that are, that are well-rounded. So they're going to bring a broader perspective to medicine and so mm -hmm. on. And I think that probably exists today still. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it exists across multiple fields. Um, actually, my history degree hasn't been a detriment in terms of me seeking employment often. Um, tr tr truthfully, degrees are not really much of a factor in employment um, today. But, you know, I, I think that the well-roundedness um, that a Starfleet officer would need would probably have to be a requisite considering how many different cultural melus they run into. Well, yeah, especially if you're going to be in a command role. And yeah. you're, because the, the starship captains, particularly large starships like the Enterprise, they have a diplomatic function and, and role as well. Yes. Well, I find it interesting in future episodes, we're going to discover that like Riker takes part in plays. He plays um, jazz. Mm -hmm. He plays the trombone, right? Yes. He plays the jazz, trombone. jazz trombone. <laughs> um, but they all do like data does poetry readings and painting. And he also plays violin. Right. It does seem like there is kind of, an expectation almost of recreational activity among the officers and maybe and you know in some ways Picard might be might be an outlier because he is so dedicated to his job he has to be pushed into doing these kind of things right so right. It, you know I think it's an interesting quirk on the character because like you said in a command function you really would want someone who has the ability to appreciate the nuances of people's cultures, including their own. But I think there's also kind of this interesting parallel where, you know, I, th I look at the function of the holodeck and I wonder why, you know, beyond recreation, why is it there in terms of a real, you, you and I have been talking about ontology in the past. Mm -hmm. For those at home that don't know, ontology is basically the, um, the study of what things are, like on, in terms of a real pure natural level, like what is a ball? Well, you start breaking down things. Well, it's round, it's spherical, stuff like that. And here's what it does. From an ontological perspective, I think the holodeck really does serve many points. But Picard says, you know, at, when he's walking into it, um, it's there not only for training, but it's also there for recreation. I think part of the reason the holodeck might be there, and it may be something that the officers really need, um, I think it has somewhat of a psychological um aspect to it in terms of how the crew uses it well i was just thinking about that because it, it might relate to the situation that many people have been in for the last year with the pandemic where mm -hmm. they're limited and to where they can go who they can see and if you make the comparison to people being on a starship granted it's a very large vessel i think the enterprise has what 1200 or so people you know um, uh, the previous episode that I saw, which was Rascals, uh, which is season five, uh -huh. uh, Riker, that's when the, the Ferengi like take over the ship and Riker mm -hmm. has to give the crew count. And he's like, there's 1,014 people on here. So okay, there's give right. or take a thousand people on there at all times. But even though that, I mean, it's a large ship, but that gives you a sense that, you know, to have sufficient space for a thousand people. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not a Dyson sphere or anything like that. 
so that there really might be a need to uh, one of the one of the, the 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 needs that the holodeck might fulfill is people be able to basically <laughs> like in the pandemic people have just wanted to go outside freely go outside wherever they wanted and that's exactly what maybe the holodeck the function of the holodeck for a crew that may feel like they are sequestered you know in a in a, a confined space so this is going to be an interesting kind of dovetail, but it, it has it has everything to do with what we're talking about. Um, on their Star Trek ship posting web board, we started talking about you know one of the big criticisms of Star Trek Discovery is that it's, it feels like the crew cries a lot, like those characters cry because they're dealing with traumatic things going on around them, and you know there's a certain contingent and like, well, these people are crying all the time. They're, they're kind of wusses. And I don't think that what I think is, you know, if you really look at it, if, if you think about the physiological stress that people go through, probably in space travel alone, you would have to imagine that it takes a psych, a real psychological toll on them. It's not only like, you know, that you said here in the pandemic with like the isolation but, you know, having to live in anti-gravity, which is still not, you know, real gravity, having to eat um, food that is just re, um, reordered protein molecules and not actual food itself. I think that there are a lot of things that we don't see going on that try to mimic real life aboard or real life on a planet the best it can like 10 forward for example like suddenly the ship has a bar and a really nice bar too <laughs> mm -hmm. but i i think that the what i'm getting to is that i think these holodecks kind of serve as a mediating function for kind of the unhidden trauma of space travel that you know the these <laughs> these crewmates might be going through well you're bringing up a good point because you know this is the the, the you know the whole star trek uh storyline of course is fiction and then if you bring up the question does it really represent what it would be like to travel on an interstellar space spaceship and you know we'll might have a have to have a um podcast uh, specifically to that paper you found about the the mathematics behind actually creating warp warp drive. Yes, and you know it, while we're talking, it made me think of um, you know the movie The Martian. Mm -hmm. You know Matt Damon's on based on the Andy Weir novel, right? He's he's marooned on Mars, and the gravity's less there. But because he was on a terrestrial studio, you can't see any difference in the gravity and so on. Yeah. You know, what kind of physiologic stress, what kind of psychological stress does that create? The other thing is in the, the interplanetary ship uh, that, you know, left Mars and went to Earth and then they decided to turn around and add 593 days or something to their mission to save Watney and come back, it seemed like it was a very, um, you know, enjoyable, other, I mean, zero gravity and so forth, but those people on that ship did not seem under much stress. And we could probably understand this a little bit more if we wanted to is, you know, right now, the best we have in terms of a, a space vessel is the International Space Station. Mm -hmm which is pretty much tight quarters. And, um, you know, it's, it, it may not be the best environment because one contact I had actually really did have with the uh, peripherally with the European Space Agency is they have a real problem with just exhaled moisture from the astronauts and the cosmonauts. And they have a mold problem up there. Oh, yeah. And it stinks too. I mean, it's not just the metallic smell of space, 
they, you know, they have some sort of shower function, but those, they, it's, I think it's kind of smelly up there. Well, there, there's also the, um, so just to go through training, astronauts here and all over the world, cos- Russian cosmonauts or European space um, agents, uh, they all go through like several rounds of psychological testing to make mm-hmm. sure that they can even before they even get into onto mm-hmm. um, a rocket to go mm-hmm. up. So I have to imagine like the people who are going up are going up knowing that they are going to have to be dealing with some real um, difficult situations just from the closeness of everything alone. Mm-hmm. And even, you know, we, we discussed this all the way back at Farpoint maybe the captain really does need to go to the holodeck because if I was driving a ship with a thousand people on it and we just puncture one hole somewhere on the ship and everyone dies in the vacuum of space, like that's a lot of stress to be carrying around, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I'm going to start watching this show again called the expanse. Have you heard of it? Mm. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So, um, I watched the first two seasons. One thing that I liked was they they really tried to express what real space battles would look like, and what 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 real interstellar travel would look like in the future, based on the actual physics and technology we have now. Of course, with some um, science fiction things added in to make mm-hmm. you know interstellar space travel workable. Mm-hmm. But one thing that like those characters go through is just this immense physical toll and they have to spend like so much time just strapped into a chair because you know they're the sheer force of the gravitons that they're getting hit with as they're moving through space you you kind of have to you just have it's kind of like being a fighter pilot right after the jays yeah you have to learn how to just sit there and take it Mm mm-hmm and I think it's it says something in the future that you have a place like the holodeck that not only is a continuation of the artificial, kind of the artificial, um, I, I don't want to say reality because it's not artificial reality. What am I trying to say? I guess this, the ship is kind of a biosphere, right? Mm-hmm. It is, yeah. But now you're stepping onto something that is kind of a, you know, a psychological extension of the mind in many ways. Mm -hmm. It, you know, Counselor Choi is there and we don't really see what kind of patients she's dealing with until later seasons and what kind of things they're dealing with. But I have to imagine that with a ship full of a thousand people, even if you had like a few hundred counselors there... You just wouldn't be able to deal with everyone um, on a qualitative level in the office or on the or on the couch, you know. Right. I think that you would need something like the holodeck to maybe help facilitate healing. Well, here here's here's something I just thought of. What are the limitations as to what program uh, you could you could use in the holodeck? So, so suppose somebody in the 24th century read about psychedelic mushrooms and so forth. And they wanted to have a psychedelic experience, but oh, yeah. they didn't have access to that chemical. Could they somehow go back into the library, the computer library and say, look, I want you to make a program in the holodeck that would, you know, uh, give me a sim experience basically to using LSD. Probably. I mean, you could probably simulate through a series of flashes in your... I don't know. I think in the future that's a very... I think psychedelics, especially in Star Trek, are a very interesting conversation because they touch on it a little bit in um, Voyager where Chakotay has a device Mm. that helps him go on his... um, journeys the spirit journeys Mm -hmm. which are terribly anachronistic and not very Mm -hmm. native american at all Mm -hmm. um 
but he mentions that like you know at some point they they use this device as a substitute for psychedelics and it induces a psychedelic state i think in the future you wouldn't necessarily have to deal with actually taking some sort of strata or inhaling some sort of herb or anything like that to initiate a psychedelic effect i bet you that you would act actually be able to initiate it through a piece of technology um you know as far as a holodeck is concerned you could probably you could probably create you could probably create a psychedelic experience but speaking as someone who's had his own psychedelic experiences Mm mm-hmm I think it would be very hard to mimic the lucidity and myriad nature of the experience. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of things that go into the experiential aspect of it, which, you know, gets back to the episode because one thing that the holodeck does do, um, and this is kind of fast forwarding a little bit, the episode when Picard returns dressed up appropriately because originally he goes to the holodeck in his uniform and he meets Madeline um Dixon Hill's secretary who's mm-hmm. like you know funny funny suit Dix mm-hmm. and they lost <laughs> a bet um one thing that we see happen is the femme fatale I forget her name let me Uh, God, what was her name for a second? I'm thinking, oh, I can't find it on memory. Oh, the woman that comes in that ends up getting murdered. Yes, her. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking for her. She's the, yes, I'm starring, also starring guest stars. Uh... Oh, okay, Jessica Bradley. That was her name, Jessica Bradley. Okay. So uh, Jessica Bradley shows up, and she wants Dix to investigate uh, the location of something. And she pays him his vig, and then she leaves. And then Picard has to go back to right. uh, run a meeting. Yes. And, and there he has that entire, like, this kind of giddy schoolboy moment where he's talking about how real and wonderful it was and then yeah. he invites um himself beverly um, and data ship, data and a ship historian right even though beverly wants to just spend time with picard alone right um and they go back properly dressed one thing that um getting kind of to your question of psychedelics and fast forwarding you know, when the holodeck malfunctions in this episode, one thing uh-huh. that it turns off, and it later turn, re, it's later revealed in the series that they can't actually turn it off, is the safeties, yes. safety um, feature right. of the holodeck itself. Right, yeah. So getting into your question of, like, could you sim- simulate a psychedelic experience? I would have to say, ultimately, like, you can mimic one, but you couldn't because it's not an alternate. It's not necessarily altering your perception. Mm-hmm. Like you would have to somehow in, induce the hologra- the holodeck to alter your perception. And in some ways it does alter your perception because one cool thing we should mention about the holodeck is um, how it, handles distance so the holodeck mm, is a mm-hmm. relatively small space yes it right. projects distance in, onto the farthest mm-hmm. wall and as you move along the holodeck um it actually moves the image along with you so mm-hmm. you're, con- you're really kind of walking in place the entire time you know that's a i think that's a really interesting feature from the concept of the mind itself and how we because the holodeck in, in some ways is a big brain for people to play in 
Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, you were about to say something. Go. No, I'm just going to say that it's a, it's it's a much the holodeck in Star Trek is is superior to whatever sort of similar um, artificial environment they create in Hunger Games. Yes. Oh yeah, very true. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the holodeck is. You know, they're going to deal with episodes later on, especially with um, Lieutenant Barkley. Oh, yes. When it comes to things like holodeck um, addiction and actually falling into the idea that, like, you value the hologram more than you value real people. Jordy actually deals with this, too. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, Yes. I think in some ways uh, the holodeck of the future is both a, you know, would be a great achievement, but would also, I I just don't know how you don't lose people to it really. You when you say lose people that they just go into it and don't want to come out. Well, especially so, you know, in, in the future, they've made it seem on the show that people don't have to worry about the acquisition of things and money. So if you didn't have to worry about the th- acquisition of things and money, let's let's say you want to buy a holodeck. Actually, they do this in Picard. Um, if you wanted to buy a holodeck and set it up as your room. Oh, yeah, right. You know, what's the difference between living in a holographic room and living on a holodeck? Oh, yeah. Well, that gets into the one episode with Moriarty. Yeah. Oh, I was actually Ben and I started watching that one today before I had to go to yeah. bed. Yeah, because Moriarty yeah. realizes that he's a hologram, right? But you know, this also gets into the question um, later on Voyager that they deal with a lot in terms of the emergency um, medical hologram or the doctor. At the oh, end. yes, that's right, that's right. And he eventually is a. They actually uh, furnish him a device. Um, that allows him to leave. But that allows him to walk around the ship and actually leave the ship. Um, I forget what it's called at the moment, but they actually give him sentience outside of um, the holodeck and actually make him a real person. So from a, a real science perspective, I wonder where technology is because we have holographic images. And I think some of them are but well, we talked about this where, what was it talked about that the holographic um, oh, know, yeah. music, music, music presentations and that sort of oh, thing. Oh yeah. You, so there's been a bunch of um, companies that have created holograms of uh, deceased singers yes, and that's songwriters right. and have them show right. up at um, concerts. They've done it for Michael Jackson. They've done it for Tupac, Dio, a bunch of people. Yeah. I think it gets into the question of, um, you know, the the thing about the holograms that we're dealing with now, like for example, the Tupac one, um, that's just a recording. That, that's, and, and and plus, it's a it's a it's a somehow the technology involves you know projection of a light image and light based yeah. image, as we're what we're dealing with in Star Trek is actually that something that rearranges molecules and has physical presence and there's at one point there's some comment somewhere where it says the technology of rearranging molecules into different structures there's some parallel in how the holodeck works and how the transporter works yes well it gets one question that star trek gets into and i know we said we weren't going to get into the heavy questions but here's one what is really the nature of life and death when you can when you can alter states of matter to where you know maybe the 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 physical is no longer the only definition of what it means to be alive and, you know the sh- the show will deal this and we'll we'll actually deal with this um very seriously in the next episode Dadalore, when it comes to the crystalline entity which is basically a silicate based life form Plus, what else has this come up so far in previous episodes this season in terms of beings that are pure energy and do not seem to have any material 
uh, substance. So <coughs> Star Trek maybe posits the idea that these beings are actually beings in themselves. In some ways, the holodeck may actually be a it may be a crew within a crew almost mm -hmm. you know this is the crew of people that are here to or these are the programs that are here to help this crew of people deal with the travails that they're dealing with in space mm -hmm. um in picard's case we're going to solve the mystery or explore the 1940s um one thing that I find funny, and they kind of use this a lot in mystery tropes, um, people from South America, if they look different, they look Oh, different. yes. Yeah. So, you know, Data is obviously like bleach white, white, white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they keep making the joke like he's no South American I've ever seen. South, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, South American I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, one thing that I really do kind of delight in is the kind of amazement that they have about history you know they don't necessarily look at us as they don't look at the 1940s as like this savage period and it's it's a very interesting counterpoint to like q because q shows up at uh encounter at far point and he's wearing that world war ii uniform of mm -hmm. i think a colonel and he makes a point like you know this is a period of savagery in your history right right where you were you were you were pursuing patriotism and trying to take out the commies yes um but you know if you look at how the the crew of the enterprise deals with it they're very much enraptured by the idea of these periods in history mm -hmm. and the people that lived in it and i think that that is a very interesting counterpoint to q if if we can stop and talk about this for a moment um they very much have an appreciation of aesthetic that I find very interesting. Because if you look at like the aesthetic of the future, it's very kind of bare and minimal. Like there's a lot of color, but if you look at what people own, there's not a lot of things that people own, mm -hmm. it seems. Mm -hmm. But if you go to these like for for example if we were to skip forward to another episode um when data is playing sherlock holmes and you go to 221 b baker street one thing that i find always interesting about victorian mysteries and victorian literature is kind of the materialism that surrounds that era mm -hmm. that era because if you look at 221 b baker street in holmes's apartments like they're just packed with things. And oh yeah, that's like right. Nick Nick Knacks, mementos yes. and tools yes. and everything, and they make a very big deal about him owning these things and having right. all these things. Right. Um, even Dixon Hill's office, you know, he has a gun, he has these suits, he has these desks, he has all these papers and radios, and you know, even Picard has this moment where he turns on the radio and he's kind of delighting in kind of the atmosphere around him. Mm -hmm. and it's very interesting to see people from that society who have kind of embraced this minimalism mm -hmm. for a moment kind of disengage from it and mm -hmm. really sink themselves into like the materialist material aesthetic around them right like even the suits right um it, it's very funny to think that the card has like a 1940s zoot suit Mm -hmm. sitting around in his um his quarter somewhere but even then like they t you know they've talked about in shows now how they they deal with um clothing you put them actually back in the replicator you replicate your that's you right replicate fresh clothes right so maybe in the future like you can replicate a full costume right if you want to go and dress up as a knight you can replicate a, a suit of armor yeah your, your quarters and then walk down to the holodeck right. and then you know turn it back into the replicator when you're done right so if if the if the enterprise has that technology obviously it's very simple for q as we've seen yeah so well you know there was there was one thing about you said about you know existence and so forth i guess there's one important point toward the end when 
uh, Picard is going to leave the holodeck. And oh, the yes. one police friend of his says, Dix, when you leave, will I still exist? Are my wife and kid and kids going to be there? And Picard or Dick says to him, I really don't know. McNary. Yeah, Lieutenant McNary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think in... there are some real moral conundrums that the show will get into when it comes to holograms mm-hmm. in terms of their treatment, in terms of what it really means to have and use this holodeck. Um, you know, there's there's an episode later on where tra- Lieutenant Barkley is in person is using um, members of the Enterprise bridge crew and mm-hmm. having them impersonate other characters, mm-hmm. some of them in some very scandalous ways. Mm-hmm. Um, one aspect of the holodeck, and they kind of, they actually talk about it a lot in DS Nine, like the holodeck at the hollow suites on DS Nine are almost used as a brothel. Yes. So, right. you know, I think that there's a real ethical concern and consideration about what people will actually do if you gave them something like a holodeck. Mm-hmm. And we've already had discussions about this and, you know, not taking this into a world ter- weird term, but to talk about like the sexual ramifications oh, of yeah. things like a holodeck. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Know, one thing that we're having right now in society are... Um, sex bots they're really mm-hmm. big in japan and they're really advancing rapidly and ai is starting to actually be integrated into them mm. you know it and we'll get into this conversation when it comes to data but if you create a sentient be an artificial sentient being what sort of rights do you have in terms of their what sort of responsibility do you have in terms of their rights and dignity if they have any in and, that and that will be addressed in detail in a future episode, yes. But I, I think that this also applies now to holograms, too. I can see that, sure, yeah. Like, you know, if these holograms, and even Moriarty, if Moriarty has this sense of, you know, actually existing, you know, we he started out the um, episode Ben and I were watching today. It's like, how long have I been just stored? On well, there? that, 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 the episodes that involves him are the ones that really focus focuses this these points yes Yes. well you know i think there's also the question of what happens when uh i forget does the story and die when he's shot by um cyrus red block goon no i think they were able to eventually evacuate him off Yeah. yeah right but, you know, there's there's also the question of, okay, what happens if there's an episode where Wesley Crusher and one of his school chums goes skiing on the holodeck? What happens if they break their neck on a slope in the holodeck? Like, what are the bounds of the safety limits there? Um, Here, let me, let me make a really off-color joke. Sure, go if ahead. If Sonny and Cher... If Sonny from Sonny and Cher were skiing in the holodeck and oh, yes. hit a tree, would he still right. be here? <laughs> like, Ooh, yes. You know, but I think that's a really realistic question. Like, well, there's is been there there, like a medical. How are people protected in this thing? Well, that gets into the question: is how far does the, do the safety measures go? Yeah. Because like when 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 in future episodes when uh, Worf uses it for Klingon military training, you know they're using bat lifts and you know so forth. And thank you for bringing that up. I thank you for bringing it up. I wanted to talk about that because there it gets back to what I say about the psychological nature of what these crews are dealing with. Right. Um, Worf isn't the only one using that calisthenics program. His seven-year-old son Alexander's using it too to go in there every so often and murder digital people. Oh, yeah, there you go. But like, I think that there's some questions there. Like, should, how would you feel, Dad, if I was seven years old and I was walking onto a holodeck every day and murdering Nazis with a assault weapon? 
like replaying D-Day at eight. Well, the murdering Nazis part I'd be fine with, but the fact that you were doing it at age seven. And now this, this raises the discussion to a more serious level that what, <laughs> how our current video game technology, current violent video game technology where adults or even younger children are able to kill other people so, in video games. So what we know about that, and you know, there's been a lot of study on this now because this question comes up a lot. Um, I think the difference between, and I think you bring up a very good question. You know, the holodeck is immersive and you actually take part and do things in the holodeck where when it comes to the video games, where it's on, whether it's on a PC or on a console, because you still have the um, controllers and the screens and stuff, there's there's still a psychological disconnection between what yes. you're doing, where you know it's not. Agree. Real. Yes. Right. But but this is but what's happening now. Yeah. Well, this is where it gets interesting. They're starting to find people who pilot drones for the military suffering from PTSD because that physical disconnection is not there for them. Because they may be piloting this drone, but they know that they're actually killing people with that drone. When that Predator drone drops a bomb in Bahrain, there's a pilot in Texas sitting in a shed someplace on a simulator who knows that he killed someone versus a kid who killed five other people playing Call of Duty. Well, and here's the other thing that you have these... But um, on the holodeck, what's the difference? What's the difference? Yes. And now you have these uh, virtual reality headsets Mm -hmm. that basically, you know, immerses you into a scene similar to what you'd, it wouldn't have the physicality of the holodeck, but it would immerse you into the scene. And I assume that there are virtual reality settings or games, whatever, where an individual can use a weapon to kill somebody else. Oh, yeah. Well, now we're getting to the very, you know, now the question of like the actual effects of video games really does come into play because, you know, when we're talking about, you know, in the 90s when I was growing up, the first video game that really caused a big stir um, that I remember was Mortal Kombat. Mm-hmm. And I had Mortal Kombat growing up. I had all th- the first three Mortal Kombats. You and Mom let me have Mortal Kombat. So. Mom did. I didn't know. <laughs> Whatever. Yes, <laughs> I didn't understand. But right. you know, the thing is, people thought that we were going to play Mortal Kombat and then we were going to go beat each other to death. Mm-hmm. And like none of us did that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think Call of Duty creates school shooters. Mm-hmm. If, if you catch my drift. Mm -hmm. however i think that if you developed an augmented reality where you were allowed to commit the worst offenses that you your heart or twisted self desires you know, I think there's a question there of what sort of actual effect it would have on you as a person. Because th- there's some really difficult things that we don't talk about in society that a holodeck would be able to enable without mm-hmm. anyone, quote unquote, being harmed, in, mm-hmm. you know, in the traditional human non Star Trek sense that we're talking, you know, mm-hmm. the flesh and blood, you and I. Mm-hmm. But in the future, like, if if you wanted to i i don't even want to suppose some of these things but like you know what stops someone from going inside a holodeck if they schedule their time and doing horrible morally reprehensible things you know not even murdering people but what if someone you know for their you know, I, I, I just worked eight hours in engineering. I'm going to go torture someone for three hours and then meet you at 10 forward. Well, I mean, suppose that somebody, you know, 
had a, um, you know, a falling out with somebody or oh, there was yeah. a major conflict, then the person may not do anything physical to that person that they didn't, that they intensely did not like, but they could program the holodeck to present that person and then they could get revenge on them w- oh, in yeah. every way they wanted. Oh, it, it is completely pl- plausible because, as I mentioned previously, um, Lieutenant Barkley does an entire program where he mm-hmm. installs the members of the Enterprise as members of the program. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that is a really concerning thing to... Um, kind of continuously question as we move forward with more immersive entertainment technologies because they Mm -hmm. are really you know they are really getting immersive i know that you've had more experience with um recent virtual reality than i have in terms of oculus headsets Mm -hmm. you know uh if if you would just speak for some of the people at home for a moment i know that you've gotten um the ability to do some of like the kayaking oculus programs and stuff like that what do you think of them? Oh, I don't know. It, it, it was just amazing because the big thing was I had an Oculus headset on and it was a, a National Geographic. I was um, on a raft outside of a National Geographic vessel in the Antarctic and it mm-hmm. lowered down a kayak. And then it sort of, you know, the as you look, it says, okay, here, get into the kayak. And I couldn't figure out how to step off the floating deck onto into the cockpit if that's the right term of the kayak because it's like i'm gonna fall i'm gonna fall into the water you know i i it's it's not stable Mm -hmm. and i was totally disoriented and i had to have somebody hold my arm so that I could then step into the kayak and feel comfortable with the process. Wow. And, and then, you know, there was an invitation to pick up the double-bladed paddle and start kayaking through this ice field. And there was a lot of currents taking you through the ice field. And, you know, you would see fish and penguins and killer whales and all kinds of things in the water. And, sometimes the current took you so fast that there was, there was no waves or anything like that. It was all flat water, but it was so disoriented. I started getting nauseous and had to stop Mm -hmm. after about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It it was, it was good. It was fun, but it, it was, it was like, it ended up being stimulus over overload. I think that's one of the reasons I just started getting ill. I wonder if, it would be an interesting storyline if they would ever explore in Star Trek. Um, I wonder what the initial holodecks were like in terms of people dealing with that sort of stimuli. Actually, we kind of know that because in Enterprise, they go onto that star base and um, they have a holodeck on there. No, no, Tucker is on that ship with that reptilian race where they have a holodeck. Oh yes, that's right. When and, he, gets, he gets when pregnant. he gets pregnant, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's been a long road. Oh, they do. Here to there. Yeah, they. Yeah, they do. Have, that's right. That other alien race that were kind of very, you know, nice, scaly reptilian people. They had the holodeck. Yeah, that's right. They did yeah. have the holodeck. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you reminded me of that because it really, of course, you know, Enterprise being in the early 2000s it was kind of like an historical throwback to say to, you know, to kind of introduce the idea of the holodeck by the idea coming from a different, different uh, species from an alien race. Yeah. Oh, what do you think the object is that Cyrus Redblock is talking about that he wants Picard to go and get, they never talk, they never reveal what it is. I don't know. I don't know. I, I I always thought that it was like a diamond or something. I thought it was. It's it reminded me of the 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 Maltese uh, falcon. Yeah. Story that it was some some valuable object or something like that. Um, yeah. 
I like the Cyrus Redblock character a lot. I did too. Right. Um, I think that actor did a very good job. He did. He did a very good job. Yeah. So um, we'll end it there for tonight. This has been sure. a really fun discussion. I yeah, it has expected. been. Um, yeah. You know, next episode, we're going to be looking at data lore, which is right. the introduction of lore and um, an exploration to data's origins, which we're really right. looking forward to. Um, Jake, thank you for joining me tonight. Thank you, Jay. It was fun as always. Uh, perfect. And thank you, everyone at home. See you later. Uh, hope you enjoyed where no bugs has gone before. Yep. Bye. Bye.